Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Essen, where I think for a change, the weather was beautifully sunny today. And I'm uh, delighted to host the um, latest installment of our international lecture series. We'll be joined today by Anna Aslanyan and by Friedrich Balke. Now, our guest speaker today will be Anna Aslanyan, who will present her extraordinary book, Dancing on Ropes, Translators and the Balance of History, which came out last year. The book was published to huge critical acclaim in the English language press and deservedly so. Anna knows very much uh, what she's talking and writing about, having been a prolific translator herself. She has, among others, translated into Russian works of fiction by novelists such as Zay Smith, Jonathan Leatham, or uh, Ali Smith. But I don't think I'll be giving away too much by pointing out that the book also revolves around what you might call not written, but oral translations. I'm, of course, talking about interpreters. In this field, too, Anna has personal experience, if I'm not mistaken, for she has also been employed as a service interpreter in courts. Now, interpreters are a rarely studied group, perhaps partly because they are thought to operate uh, smoothly without friction. And it's almost as if they make themselves invisible behind the words and messages they relay in real time. Now, one of the many merits, in my opinion, of Anna's book is that it lifts the curtain on translators and interpreters. She presents them not as pen pushers or as linguistic bureaucrats, but as individuals engaged in an extremely hazardous occupation. Nor are interpreters and uh, translators immune to error. Here, too, Anna provides new perspectives by zooming in on mistranslations that, for better or worse, made history. Anna's talk will be followed by comments from Friedrich Balke, and I really couldn't have imagined a more suitable respondent. Friedrich Balke is professor of media studies and theory at Ruhr University Bochum. As such, he's uniquely qualified to probe the technological backdrop against which the changing practices of translation need to be set, such as the use of headphones, recording devices, or more recently, computer-assisted translation tools. They all undoubtedly had an impact on the work of interpreters and translators. But as Friedrich Balke's research demonstrates, he's also attuned to the philological nitty gritty of translation work and combining both aspects, technology and philology, Friedrich published pioneering work on what he calls media philology. Yeah? And with this paradigm of media philology, Friedrich Balke and his colleagues really delineated a new research field. And I'd be curious to know how this approach has informed his take on Anna's book. Uh, but now it's time to head over to our guest speaker, Anna Aslanyan, just one final comment for those of you who are with us for the first time, just a word about proceedings. Anna will be presenting for about 35 to 45 minutes and then Friedrich Balke will comment on her talk for about 15 minutes before the discussion will be opened up to the public. Uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Daniela. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be speaking here today. I'm going to share with you a few stories of translation. Some of them taken from my book, which has just been mentioned, Dancing and Roads, Translators and the Balance of History, and others uh, from my career as a translation interpreter. Some of them are going centuries back, uh, others are quite recent. They all prove one important point, obvious and at the same time easily overlooked, namely that translators can never rely on words alone. In fact, translation is about finding a space between gaps or a compromise between meanings. It is a balancing act as the title of the book suggests. Uh, Dancing on Ropes is in fact a quote from uh, John Dryden, a 17th century English poet and translator. It is almost impossible to translate verbally and well, he wrote, and at the same time, uh, to, uh, to, uh, that's what he wrote uh, in the preface to one of his translations of the classic, uh, classics. And then he uh, drew a conclusion that is uh, still valid today. It is much like Dancing on Ropes with fettered legs. So uh, you have this figure dancing on a rope uh, in mind with as joyful as well as uh, somewhat sinister connotations. And this is, I think, an apt image for the profession. So translators must simultaneously work towards several goals, to get the message across and not to break certain constraints, to stay upright and to maintain flexibility. And to keep everything in balance, they constantly move between these near impossibilities and the world moves with them. Uh, human communication, even in one language, always comes with a proviso that we actually understand and are understood much less than we hope. And early in my interpretive career, a court case made this especially clear to me. 
uh, the woman I was interpreting for just sat there with her head buried in her hands throughout the hearing, which concerned the custody of her child. And I didn't realize at first, and she wouldn't tell me when asked, how little those legal formulae actually meant to her when all she wanted to know was whether she would be reunited with her son. Well, I did my best to translate everything as it was said, showing off my legalese. And then with, uh, the judge got to, it would be my intention to allow this appeal. And she still didn't react to the good news. Afterwards, as her lawyer explained the judgment in plain English and I duly interpreted it, and I felt as if the dead weight of dictionaries was literally falling off my shoulders as she looked up and nodded. This time she understood it all. So there was but one example demonstrating that words alone are often not enough. And there are of course numerous others spanning centuries and continents uh, going back as far as the days of the Ottoman Empire. Um, starting from the 16th century, the Ottomans communicated with foreigners through dragomans, as translators used to be called in the Near East. I'm going to try and create a bit of uh, atmosphere here by um, showing you this picture. Hopefully what you can now see uh, on your screens is um, a period painting. It depicts a uh, court audience and there are dignitaries speaking and the dragoman stands on the left wearing his blue uniform. So the job of uh, dragomans involved, just as ours does today, much more than just conveying radio messages. They translated orally and in writing, but they also drafted notes and negotiated deals, ran errands and sold secrets. They intervened, adding and cutting, sometimes changing the meaning, often reframing the source, glossing cultural aspects or contextualizing political demands, rephrasing the author's wording or rewriting their introduction. So why didn't they just restrict themselves to getting things across in a neutral and accurate fashion? Were they perhaps too scared to repeat certain utterances or too self-important not to put in uh, their two pennies worth? Or were they wise enough to know better than to stick to the original? Uh, all of the above, it seems, and much besides. So the majority of that uh, era's dragomans were essentially intermediaries, crossing cultural, religious, ethnic, political, and of course, linguistic boundaries between the East and the West. And it was their versatility that over time brought some of them real power. So um, let us now move a couple of centuries forward from the very beginnings of the profession to the middle of the 19th century, when two empires, British and Russian, were engaged in the so-called great game, a diplomatic confrontation over Central Asia. And cultural assimilation was the key role of that game. Let me try and uh, introduce one of the players. Um, this is the Reverend Joseph Wolf, uh, who was a polyglot preacher. And he uh, described his experience in a memoir titled uh, Narrative of a Mission to Bokhara. Over the course of that journey, he translated parts of the Quran from Arabic into Persian, conversed with Jews, Turks, and Armenians, and preached in English, German, and Italian. Uh, Wolf's knowledge of these languages, however, would have been less used to him had he not adopted the motto, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. His story illustrates the value of assimilating into the culture of a people whose language you are trying to speak. So in 1843, Wolf wrote to the British military to raise alarm about two officers, Captain Arthur Connolly and Colonel Charles Stoddard, who had been imprisoned in the city of Bakara. Some feared that they might be dead, but Wolf was convinced that they were alive and needed to be rescued. A committee was formed, funds raised, and Wolf, volunteering to undertake the mission for expenses only, set off for the holiest city in Muslim Central Asia. He prudently stocked up on maps, annotated in Arabic characters, and his baggage also contained a clergyman's attire, copies of the Bible, silver watches, and three dozen copies of Robinson Crusoe in an Arabic translation. As he recalled, on reading the book which I gave them, the Arabs exclaimed, oh, that Robinson Crusoe must have been a great prophet. And so Wolf, a quixotic Victorian gentleman, proceeded on his journey. Along the way, visiting legations and attending meetings with officials, he enlisted their help, uh, though not so much linguistic as administrative. Because for a European in those times, traveling in Central Asia was impossible without letters of introduction. 
and so equipped with references, Wolf commenced the last leg of his mission. He was, as he writes in his journal, dressed in full canonicals the entire distance, being determined never to lose sight of my position as Mullah, on which alone I soon perceived my safety dependent. He also goes on to remark, the uncommon character of these proceedings attracted crowds, all which was favorable to me. So Wolf, uh, Wolf's willingness to observe local customs proved as important to him as his command of Bokara Persian, which was the language of the court. Before his first audience with the Emir, asked by one of the courtiers if he would be prepared to submit to an official written ritual, Wolf said that he'd gladly perform it 30 times, let alone the prescribed three. In his own words, I bowed repeatedly and exclaimed in unseasonably, peace to the king, until his majesty burst into a fit of laughter. And all, of course, um, of course, all the rest standing around us. Uh, what might have seemed an embarrassment then uh, later turned out to be a lifesaver. So um, let me share with you another um, visual. Um, Wolf arrived in Bokhara too late to do anything for Stoddard and Connolly. These are the officers and gentlemen that you can now see. Uh, on your screens, and um, uh, they had been executed by orders of the despotic ruler. Uh, that tragic outcome resulted from a complex setup, but cultural misrealizations must have played their part in it. For instance, Charles Stoddard, for all his knowledge of Persian, had failed to make himself understood on his arrival in Bokhara. He was a brave soldier, but a uh, poor diplomat, so he rode in full regimentals to the emir's palace instead of respectfully dismounting as was custom. And then during the audience with Emir, he broke every rule in the book. Unlike Wolf, who tended to go the extra mile to observe ceremony, Stoddard comported himself as if he was on a working visit to a minor official. And as a, re as a result, he was thrown into a dungeon. But now um, back to Joseph Wolf. Uh, throughout his stay in Bokhara, the Emir kept the preacher on a short lead often sending his uh, uh, chamberlain to him with various questions. For instance, when the emir wished to know who governed England, Wolf supplied a list of names, but then the messenger returned in a fury and accused him of lying. So apparently his account differed from the one that the despot had received from Stoddard. Brought before the emir, Wolf rescued the situation by giving him, as he put it, a complete idea of the constitution of England, whatever that might have been. Still, these exchanges weren't getting Wolf anywhere, and he was preparing to share the fate of Stoddard and Connolly when the emir suddenly changed his mind and let him go. On his way home, uh, Wolf met a young gentleman by the name of Edward Burgess, employed by a local prince to translate English newspapers for him. Burgess then found himself in trouble when his brother, sent by the Persian government to England with a substantial sum of money, disappeared. Now essentially a hostage, Burgess got on with his work, which included translating a letter from his employers uh, to Wolf. I hope the translation will please you, he wrote to the Reverend. I have made it as near the Persian as possible to make sense of it. And I endeavored as much as our language will allow to preserve the idiom of the Persian. You who are acquainted with the latter language know how difficult that is. So when uh, he was referring to Wolf in the letter, Burgess used the title Excellency, explaining that it was the only translation he could find for a certain term with no direct equivalent in English. And so it was that Wolf briefly enjoyed a title that might have been too grand for him, but which helped him return to England safely and publish an account of his travels. Uh, now, before moving on to our next story, let's dwell on one important point. Cultural concessions have to be made not just by the, by the translator, but also by the principals. Otherwise, the intermediary alone will struggle to bring the parties to a meeting point somewhere in between their respective languages. To see how easy it is to ignore this, let's fast forward once again, this time jumping to the late 19th century, when Europeans embrace tourism, often visiting exotic countries. Travelogues of the period usually portray the guide as part and parcel of the oriental scene. The more exotic and picturesque, the better. Yet it's difficult to please tourists. They want both colorful wildness and, pick and some solid professionalism even though they have no way of evaluating the accuracy of those strange sounding words uttered by their interpreters. Self-employed linguists of that era, as always in the history of the trade, I suppose, uh, were expected to do much more than translate. They had to negotiate in spite, to wait on their clients and protect them 
to mediate, procure goods and services, and so on. And if something wasn't to the client's liking, they blamed the guy while giving him little credit for his work, no matter how diligent, and often abusing him. One happier story is that of Solomon Nigima. He would have been forgotten along with the majority of his fellow translators had it not been for his book of testimonials, which contained letters from his clients, photographs, and other proof of his employment history. Uh, a Syrian Catholic, Nigima went to a German mission school and spoke excellent English and German. He started as an interpreter with the British Army in 1885, serving in Egypt and Sudan. And after the campaign, he began working with tourists. Praised for his calm temperament, as much as for his language skills, Negima, like many interpreters then and now, had to deal with some very difficult clients. One such, for instance, was an English woman named Miss Ellen Miller, the author of a travelogue titled Alone Through Syria. Alone, in that title, refers to the fact that she had no European companions. So Miller found Negima too timid, and she was cross when he didn't encourage her bold attempts to peer into the tents of locals, on fallen ill, she expected him to nurse her. Negima was more fortunate with other clients, who also, of course, treated him as a servant, but were less hungry for exotic adventures. And many of them left glowing reviews in Negima's equivalent of a LinkedIn profile. Now, it's true that um, in, those, in those days, uh, as indeed much later, many travelers expected their guides to be cheats. Uh, here's another picture. This one is taken from a book published in, uh, uh, in, the, early, in the early 20th century, a uh, uh, sort of um, humorous travelogue, and it depicts the picture, uh, the illustration depicts a street scene in Cairo where you can see a, a guide talking to his client. So um, the uh, travelers basically projected their worst suspicions about the local population or onto the uh, profession. Bedecker books, for instance, contain some patronizing advice on dealing with the natives, including guides, as well as on the best places to hire them and the costs. Uh, one Bedecker book claimed, there are about 90 dragomans in Cairo, all more or less intelligent and able, but scarcely a half of the number are trustworthy. And we'll never know if it was the lack of professional standards or simply prejudice. But, um, um, just as an aside, uh, translation is not cricket. It involves three main players, the source, the target, and the intermediary, with at least one of them unable to grasp what's going on. And so they assume, not unreasonably perhaps, that the game is skewed and not in their favor. When they start losing, or think they do, their gut instinct is to blame the one who understands everything, the intermediary. If a written text looks unconvincing or an utterance sounds false, communication breaks down. And conversely, the less solid the source, the more difficult it is to translate. This circle of mutual mistrust is hard to break. Uh, let me show you another um, picture. This one is a, a postcard. And um, many translators and users of their services will probably find familiar motives in it. Uh, it was sent from uh, Egypt uh, and in around 1917. So you can see it uh, features a picture of a man who is dressed in native costume, there's a targush on his head, his open gaze presumably symbolizes honesty or something like that, and is captioned a trusted dragoman. But if you turn it over, the message on the back reads, this is a guide and interpreter. It says a trusted dragoman, don't believe it. Uh, my book is about translation as a practice, yet there is one theoretical aspect I'd like to touch upon here. Um, as theoreticians insist, there are two approaches in literary translation. Um, they are known as domestication and foreignization. So uh, according to the textbook definition, domestication stands for cultural uh, adaptation, whereas to foreignize means to preserve some kind of ex exoticism. But uh, let's leave theory aside and see and look at these notions. They are clearly relative notions, uh, each meaning different things to the author and the reader. Whereas to the translator, they actually look like two sides of the same coin. Um, the logic of this dichotomy is as vague as why it should be a dichotomy in the first place. After all, what any act of translation inevitably domesticates is the source, whereas what sometimes undergoes foreignization in the process is the target language. 
So since these techniques apply to different things, uh, contrasting them with each other is like comparing apples with oranges. And isn't the task of the translator to create a hybrid of the two? So if we assume that translation is a prerequisite for a truly international culture, then these principles aren't irreconcilable. Translators should try to combine the domestic and the foreign in their work, so as to avoid unnecessary explanations and at the same time not alienate the reader. The American poet and translator Eliot Weinberger applies this to multiculturalism and its effects on translation, not always positive. Um, uh, he brings to light the Iranian cliche of Orientalism, namely that scholarship follows imperialism. And uh, in uh, that essay uh, that I'm quoting, he gives an example, which is the flourishing of translation, particularly from Sanskrit and Persian in 19th century Germany, despite its having no stake in either India or Persia. Uh, Weinberger's view of uh, perceived controversies around cultural ownership is captured in this maxim. I quote, translation is not appropriation as it's sometimes uh, claimed. It is a form of listening that then changes how you speak. And uh, we could add to that, that if you think of it as a dialogue, then it's only natural that the act of conversing should also change how your interlocutor speaks in more ways than simply replacing their words by your own one at a time. Uh, the notions of foreignization and domestication uh, were formulated long before translation studies emerged as a subject. Writing in the mid 18th century, the philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder said, Homer must enter France a captain clad in a French fashion, lest he offend their right. We poor Germans, on the other hand, just want to see him as he is. I think one of the targets of his sarcasm must have been uh, the renowned 17th century translator, Nicolas de Blancourt, who preferred his classics to look inconspicuously French for ambassadors, usually dressed in the fashion of the country to which they are sent, as he put it. And then in 1813, the German scholar Friedrich Schleiermacher gave a seminal lecture framing the same question. So he said, either the translator leaves the author in peace and moves the reader towards him, or he leaves the reader in peace and moves the author towards him. Uh, Schleiermacher have favored the uh, former approach, the one that had led to the German translation boom, whose agents were unwilling to let the reader and the author meet halfway, worried that they might miss each other altogether. Now, centuries on, uh, this uh, colonization versus domestication dilemma still exists. But does it have to be one or the other? Why turn translation into a one-way street? If we can actually move in both directions, looking for a place where the author and the reader happily meet, both enriched by their respective journeys. Uh, our search for a golden mean would be more fruitful if instead of arguing who owns the words on the page, we treated them as our collective property, agreeing that the entirety of world literature belongs to us all, its writers, translators, and readers alike. Does this plan sound to the utopian? Let's hope not. Um, now it's time we turn to current affairs to consider the way translation influences them. News has long been treated as an international commodity. For instance, the first English newspapers were mainly translations from Latin, German, and French. Around 1618, when news fever caused by the 30 years war spread through Europe, it led to the emergence of the weekly Coranta or news from Italy, Germany, Hungary, Spain, and France. And later in the 17th century, other papers followed suit, uh, relying in particular on French sources to report on continental wars. In the 18th century, they printed highly interpretive translations of French and Dutch papers. Um, today, major media outlets carry stories from all over the world using foreign correspondence, if they can be afforded. And also news wires such as Reuters and Associated Press. Whichever model is used, journalists translating news are not translators in the usual sense of the word. Some argue that their task is closer to interpretation since they constantly have to rephrase, summarize, adapt, gloss and contextualize foreign sources, framing stories for their audiences. Sometimes they are called journalators and their job is known as trans editing. These neologies might sound a bit awkward, but they serve as a fairly accurate code for a process that requires translators to localize, simplify, stereotype, in short, to put things in context. Localization is, of course, not unique to journalism, because for any consumer good, such as an ad, a computer game, a website, a film, to be safely transplanted from one country to another, translation in the conventional sense is not enough. 
these products all have to be packaged differently if they are to win hearts and persons. Culturally re reframing that all translation device is indispensable in the age of globalization when the success of any venture is defined by how easily it can travel across borders. And careless copywriting result, results in uh, brand blunders. Let's have a look at one of them. Um, so this is uh, from a campaign uh, that the French mobile network operator Orange launched in uh, Northern Ireland in uh, the late 1990s. To the local Catholic population, the slogan, the future is bright, the future is orange, uh, connoted Protestant loyalism. Uh, the campaign produced little revenue, uh, and although it may not have been just the associations with the orange order that got the company into trouble, it's hard not to conclude that their creatives could have applied a little bit more local color, so to speak. Um, now let's return to the news media where the adjustment of global con uh, content for particular audiences assumes especially interesting forms. On the one hand, events unfolding in some distance, uh, distant corner of the world uh, are inevitably perceived as foreign. But on the other hand, uh, the fact that they are worth reporting so far away from where they're happening implies that the intended audience should be able to relate to them. Uh, for instance, if we're reading a novel, we may or may not care if it's a translation, but we usually realize that it is a work of fiction, whereas a news item is something we turn to for facts rather than to enjoy the style of the original. And besides, we often think of it as the original. We only remember that it's a translation when there appears to be something wrong with it. Now, any text that needs translating has room uh, both for deliberate distortions, often made in the name of ideology, and for genuine mistakes. So should accuracy always be the translator's priority? Let's look at a few examples. Uh, in 2018, when Donald Trump, then the president of the United States, referred to certain states as shithole countries, translators the world over took the trouble to mitigate this definition. The most polite version used in, in Taiwan was uh, countries where birds don't lay eggs. Japan went for countries that are dirty like toilets. In Germany, they said garbage dump. However broad the spectrum of meanings hidden in the original message, a translator's uh, choice of word can have immense consequences. You know, to give you another example, when the literal phrase death to America, it's a phrase that's been widely used in Iran since the 1979 uh, revolution. When this phrase is rendered as down with America, the world begins to make a bit more sense. Now, from uh, matters of uh, grave concern, let's move on to less momentous subjects. Uh, you think that sports, being mainly about figures and facts, would be easy to report in any language. And yet, sports and events inevitably get interpreted and misinterpreted by international commentators. Um, during the um, At the Tokyo uh, Olympics last year, during an uh, English language press conference, the Chilean reporter uh, Sebastian Namias had a very strange encounter with a Russian tennis player, Daniel Medvedev. You can see the world number two on your screens now. So the uh, journalist Namias asked, are the Russian Olympic team athletes carrying a stigma of cheaters in these games after the scandal? And how do you feel about it? So he was, of course, referring to the doping violations that in 2019, led to the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency banning Russia from all major sporting events. Uh, Daniel Medvedev exploded. That's the first time in my life I'm not gonna answer a question. He then requested that the journalist be removed. I don't want to see, uh, don't want to see him again in my interviews. Um, so um, that was the actual press conference, but then the uh, Russian response was predictable. Um, it was reported in the news that Namias called all Russian athletes cheaters. A Russian Olympic Committee official stated it has nothing to do with translation problems. Everyone understood him quite clearly. Well, clearly not everyone did. Uh, tracked down by another Russian publication, Namias said that he must have been misunderstood. He said, as far as I could understand through Google Translate, my words were slightly changed. Now, reading the reports, I spotted those changes too. Plus, I also spotted some unexpected loan words mixed zona or mixed zone and cheater instead of a perfectly normal Russian word for cheater. 
Anyway, whenever inconsistencies arise, journalists ex explain them by the fact that they are constantly in a hurry, especially when having to translate news. But then there's a curious contradiction between the right to information on the one hand and the disinformation that results from it, precipitated by time pressure. Now, is being the first to bring your readers a story from a distant part of the world worth the risk of spreading fake news? Just not, as not all texts and speeches deserve to be translated, uh, you'd say that some news warrant an instant reaction, while others simply do not. Now, um, um, an avalanche of genuinely uh, urgent news came flooding a few months ago when the West withdrew its remaining troops from Afghanistan, leaving the country in the hands of the Taliban. Some of the military interpreters who were employed by the Western armies in Afghanistan in the past two decades still remain in a dangerous position. Although America, Britain, and other countries did make some efforts to relocate linguistic contractors, in some cases, it was too little too late. When I first talked to some of the former interpreters, the general situation wasn't as bad as it became shortly afterwards. And yet for many, it was already quite desperate. So their stories remain underreported. And so let me briefly uh, outline some of the facts. To begin with, um, interpreters who worked for the British Army, um, they were initially told that they would be allowed to move to the UK, but then things didn't go as agreed. First, a scheme was introduced to protect those whose safety was compromised because of their collaboration with the Taliban's enemy. Then 400 interpreters applied and were eventually relocated to Britain. In 2018, with their temporary visas due to expire, 150 ex-interpreters, some of whom had served on the front line, realized that they, have to, they will have to reapply to remain in the country to pay 2,400 pounds for new documents. And in some cases, they still wouldn't be able uh, to bring their families over. The alternative was deportation to Afghanistan, where the risk of being killed by the Taliban was significant. Then uh, the interpreters petitioned the UK government to reconsider its policy. Uh, in 2018, the fee was uh, finally waived, and uh, 50 former personnel were granted UK visas. But at the same time, a number of other Afghan interpreters were denied entry to Britain despite being hunted by the Taliban. In 2019, the families of those who had settled in the UK were allowed to join them finally, but months later, some were still waiting for their visas. And so it went on and on. They were considered traitors in their own country, uh, but these uh, unsung heroes of the military campaign in Afghanistan, that's what the media called them on a few occasions, they did make it into the news. They were initially abandoned by the state they had served, and when it eventually accepted them, it wasn't exactly with open arms. And the interpreters who worked for the US Army have been treated similarly, if not worse. Uh, any combat veteran from Iraq and Afghanistan will tell you that his best asset is a great interpreter. The Armed Forces Journal reported as far back as in, as in 2011. The best of them didn't just translate, but were also, I quote, culturally attuned and adept at recognizing nonverbal clues or shifts. Again, these people enlisted on the understanding that they would be allowed to resettle. Until the recent events, only a fraction of them had managed to move to America, and now their situation in their home country is more dangerous than ever. Uh, and things are finally moving along, but only for some of them. One of the interpreters I spoke to, for instance, had spent more than three years with American and Canadian forces in Kandahar, and his father, he told me, asked him not to return to their village for fear of retribution. He applied for a U US visa, but after four years uh, waiting, it was rejected. When I talked to him, he was still living in Kabul. Uh, he called the process a lottery. He said he'd just do his best to look after his family. And then a few months later, the Taliban took over and he found himself in deeper trouble than ever. In his latest message, he told me he was somewhere in Europe waiting for his asylum application to be processed and relieved despite all the uncertainty to be out of the country. Now, uh, translators in armed conflicts often draw the short straw. They can never rely on the warring sides to trust them fully, nor can they expect much help from peacekeepers. The threat of retaliation is always there. Uh, last August, when the crisis in Afghanistan escalated following the military withdrawal, the UK government proposed the so-called Afghan, Afghan citizens uh, resettlement scheme. But disappointingly, six months down the line, it has yet to open. Now, let me quote briefly the British uh, Member of Parliament, Clive Lewis. 
who himself served in Afghanistan in 2009 and who is now urging the government to take action. Here's what he says. I saw Afghan interpreters translate so much more than words. In search of justification of my own place there, I turned to the interpreters, a natural target for my many questions. What did the Afghan people think of us being there? I needed to know. Did they trust us? Were they scared of us? In answering, they interpreted more than the language. They helped all of us to better understand the people, the place, the situation. So once again, here we have more proof that dialogue into languages depends on much more than words. Now, so far we have been talking about uh, human translations, but what about machines? Can they be relied upon when it comes to translating more than words? In 2018, when a, a group of experts were asked to estimate the probability of artificial intelligence outperforming humans in various tasks in the near future, their predictions suggested it will happen in translation by 2024. Among specific AI capabilities listed in the report, language translation is mentioned next to folding laundry. Uh, let's look at a few translation challenges to see if machines are any better than humans at coping with them. The linguist uh, Mark Lieberman mentions three things computers can't get right, pronouns, idioms, and common sense. He takes, uh, picks up a book, book, opens it at random, takes the French phrase, me pose au lopin, meaning that somebody stands me up. He fits it into Google Translate and gets a literal version. And doing the, sa uh, the same thing the other day, I still got, ask me a rabbit. Phones predictably fall through the cracks, as just as they always do unless rescued by luck or genius. And finally, machines still can't distinguish between registers. Um, I conducted those experiments when researching the final chapter of my book, which is about machine translation. And today the results are likely to be different because the algorithms are constantly changing as more data is being fed into them. But here is one, one last example to share with you. In, um, uh, December uh, 2020, Google Translate translated, thank you, Mr. President, into Russian as Spasibo Vladimir Vladimirovich. Uh, that was some change, but I managed to grab this um, uh, screenshot for you. So um, uh, long-term prospects aside, we can be sure of one thing. The principal aim of using computers in translation of any kind written or oral is to provide professionals with some help and to allow end users to decide how much human input is needed for a particular task. The advent of uh, the machine age has only brought the human nature of translation to the fore. Computers do their job, which includes sifting through terabytes of data to remind us of what we've already said many times over. And we keep doing our job. Now let's return very briefly to our first story, that of the Reverend Joseph Wolf and his Bokara mission. The events of uh, nearly three centuries ago show that the knowledge of local customs and traditions was often crucial in getting a translated message across and even staying alive. Uh, nowadays, if you get a name or a title or another cultural reference wrong, it's less likely to result in a beheading, but cultural markers are still vital in translation. My own mission to Bokara, so to speak, took the form of uh, several asylum cases I worked on as an interpreter. In one of them, a sex worker trafficked to Britain from Uzbekistan kept addressing everyone in Russian. Uh, she kept addressing everyone, the lawyers, the judge, and myself, using the matey second person, uh, second person singular thing, instead of using the formal Russian B. And at first I frowned at such over-familiarity over because uh, uh, it is a very over-familiar way of addressing someone. But then it occurred to me that in the woman's culture, this form of address is a token of trust and not a sign of impudence. Translating, I made sure she sounded as respectful in my rendition as she actually meant to be. And when her hearing ended, we said goodbye to each other in a way that no longer struck me as too familiar. Uh, making a cultural faux pas in a more relaxed setting can be just as bad. At the meeting with a uh, Azerbaijani businessman once, uh, their English host told a self-deprecating joke, calling himself fat. He was indeed on the biggest side, as were some of his guests. And I translated it literally, not thinking it necessary to resort to the euphemistic full-bodied or well-rounded. And the guests were all visibly shocked because a word that was deemed perfectly ordinary in my native Moscow sounded rude to people accustomed to the more cautious form of Russian spoken in Baku. One of them gently corrected me, replacing fat with portly, and I apologized. However, 
not every failure to play by local rules and, and as uh, ends in embarrassment. Uh, the most memorable form of address I've ever had to translate came from a court witness who began each of his answers with a Mr. Judge, sir. Perhaps he was channeling some TV drama or trying to fit into the unfamiliar surroundings of an English Crown Court using what he thought was the standard formula. I kept looking at the woman judge in a wig and gown who presided over the proceedings, and I thought it was time for me to take some liberties. So I changed his opening to a more appropriate one, Your Honor. Uh, and that seemed to have done the job. At least no one was charged with contempt of court. Uh, on this note, I'll, I'm going to stop to give my fellow speaker the chance to share his thoughts. Thanks very much for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. Um, and I'll hand over straight away to Friedrich and then uh, we leave more time for the discussion. That was excellent, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Anna. Um, and first of all, I'd like to say um, also thank you for the, to the KVE for having me um, tonight. And a special thanks goes to Danilo for um, inviting me, of course, and for directing my attention to Anna's book, which really is a brilliant book. And part of what I'm going to do tonight is to seduce all of you to buy the book and read it. It's a great book. And um, well, to respond to such a great book, and I mean, you heard it when you listened to Anna right away, she's a great storyteller. I think, I mean, what the book what makes the book so interesting is, you know, following the storylines, following Anna as a story a teller um, who is really able to, you know, evoke scenes where translators, as you have just, as you have just heard, balance really dancing on the ropes, as she uh, says, and um, well, um, hopefully not falling down from those ropes. So. Actually, what I'm going to do is trying to explore the metaphor, which, which of course, is the title of the book, because uh, as a matter of fact, translators, whatever they are, they are not artists in the sense that, you know, they don't balance literally on ropes. But, but still, uh, the metaphor, I think, is, is chosen with great care and, and a lot of thought is given into that. So what I'm going to do is try to explore a little bit what, what is implied in, in, in this expression, dancing on ropes. So translators dance on ropes. Think about it for a while. What is implied? What does that mean? What can that mean? They perform, one could say, a tightrope act, a Drahtseilakt, as we say in German. Anna not only dances on this tightrope herself, I think, because she's personally not just the author of the book, she's also implied professionally because she works, as we have heard, as a professional translator. So she, she made this tightrope act the subject of a book filled with examples, exciting stories, as I said, and wonderful anecdotes. If I were to attempt to boil these down, these anecdotes down into one thesis, then it would be this, translating is both a completely everyday activity, we do it all the time. And when we are explaining or paraphrasing ourselves, we do it, translating ourselves. And at the same time, it can be an extremely delicate activity fraught with infelicities as John Austin, speech act theorist and philosopher called them infelicities. Translations fail. I think it's quite basic to, to think about this uh, simple sentence. Translations fail, translators fail due to both internal and external problems and circumstances. There are chapters in Anna's book that show how, in the most extreme cases, this failure can even cost translators their lives. After all, it is not only words that are translated, but also what Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian literary critic and expert in Polyphony would deem the social and moral accents, accent, transported by those words. A translation can be correct in a literal sense, and yet 
set of faults and even fatal cultural accent. That's the reason why, as Anna says, glossing is key when, when she shows in the brilliant chapter on word worship, how religious beliefs and the related terms are translated into a new language. A translator must choose the right word, but the rightness is measured not only against lexical criteria. At the end of the day, translation is never a mere technical understanding and undertaking. That is why machines and algorithms, as we've just heard, may step up to take over translation, but they are no more successful than human interpreters. Machines also fail. It's not just human interpreters that can fail. Those who, I'm gonna come back to that point at the end of my response. Those who translate can thus fall, as I said, from the ropes at any time. Before I shed a bit of light onto the way in which Anna explains this observation, I'd like to start with two comments that highlight my own interest in translating. The first comment relates to the question of when and where the work of translating begins. Does it only start when we translate a foreign language into our own or vice versa? What does it mean to express your thoughts with words? How do we bridge this gap from something supposedly purely mental, something in our brain, thoughts to something linguistic, for example. This is precisely where translating begins. In the attempt to put our thoughts into words, or I will come back to this point in a minute, into other artifacts. Or to put it into Heinrich von Kleist's famous terms, in the gradual production of thoughts while speaking. Die allmähliche Verfertigung der Gedanken beim Reden. Kleist views translation literally as a verfertigung, production, fabrication of thoughts that are not just waiting in our brains, fully fleshed out for us to then speak them. This production proceeds at a slow space, pace, gradually, which contradicts the idea of a simultaneous translation operating with almost no delay to the pre-spoken words. L'idée vient en parlant, said Kleist, citing a French proverb, which makes thinking a byproduct of speaking. I didn't have time here to discuss the case of Mirabeau, those of you who know this Kleist text um, are, are able to you know, follow me uh, at this point. The case of Mirabeau, the French revolutionary, uh, and the question of how interpretation and revolution are intertwined. It also plays an indirect role for Anna when she thinks, when she links the interpreter with a diplomat who speaks on behalf of a particular political authority, but must at the same time speak such that he does not affront the power which has accredited him. So the revolutionary in Kleist's case, Mirabeau, does exactly this. He affronts the king's representative who had ordered the third estate to leave the place, which Mirabeau obviously rejects. So I would like to add to, to this point, to this political implications of what it means to translate correctly or not correctly. I would also like to add a Freudian aspect so it's my personal obsession with psychoanalysis, um, which, which uh, to a certain extent plays a role when I read a book on translation. So, I mean, Freud, psychoanalysis is all about translation. Because, I mean, again, where does translation begin? Thinking, as we all know, is not a completely conscious matter, meaning it is not only embedded in or generated by reflections that we control. I already alluded to it when, with the comment that translations can fail. Translations can also truly be slip ups, Fehlleistungen, the term coined by Freud, Schnitzer. And Freud's genius lay in having shown that the unconscious is structured like a language, as his French interpreter Jacques Lacan pointed out. Anna describes numerous tragic but also funny scenes in which translators betray the original, that is, 
They do not translate literally what a politician, for example, Berlusconi said. Great passages in the book about interpreters, you know, dealing with Berlusconi. Dif very difficult to translate guys, political guys like Berlusconi. So these translators, what do they do? They omit certain expressions or they compress Verdichtung in Freud. Yeah? They compress them because they have a sense of diplomacy and realize that a direct translation could result in a scandal. They diffuse the text and save the day. Diffusing a text in Freud's perspective would be a form of censorship. So this is particularly easy if the politician does not speak or understand the language into which his statement is being translated. Anna thus touches on the question of the translator's sovereignty, which provides an interesting contradiction to our idea of the assistance the translator gives. Yes, the supposedly subalterns can speak. Translators can leave something out, as Anna shows, but they can also linguistically modify the original. Anna takes stock of the entire field, or nearly all of it, in which translations and translators play a role in courts of law. For example, in Nuremberg, where Nazi war criminals were on trial, at foreign courts, as we've just heard, with indigenous peoples, but also in immigration agencies that review the right of individuals to cross national borders. As scholars of the humanities, we tend to understand translation as a relationship mainly between books or texts. And Anna's approach does look a great deal at the role of literature, questioning the widely spread idea of a word for word translation supported by the so called literalists. Jorge Luis Borges and his US translator represent a particularly interesting case because the translator became a kind of co-author to whom Borges not only willingly gave 50% of his royalties, but to whom he would also be quite happy to transfer the prestige of authorship. Why not publish Di Giovanni's translations of Borges' texts under the name of the translator, instead of adding the name of the supposed author and placing Borges over the translator's name? Is it possible to go further in recognizing translators' personal contributions as Borges did? So in, in her book, in the chapter on Borges and its translator, it is not Anna, it is Borges who poses the crucial question here. I quote Borges. When we, meaning Borges and, his, and Di Giovanni, his translator, when we attempt a translation or recreation of my poems or prose in English, we don't think of ourselves as being two men. We think we are really one mind at work. Quote and Borges. From this extreme appreciation of translation work, we seem to plunge down to the depths of disdain for it in legal or business contexts, where a growing number of translations, and I just uh, talked about this as well, a growing number of translations are offered by large international translation agencies um, at ever lower prices, which obviously has drastic effects on the quality of the translation themselves. Alarming reports on our rights of institutionalized unprofessionalism can be heard on both sides of the Atlantic. Anna tells about the case of an Iranian midwife. Extremely interesting case. I'm going to develop on that case a little bit. An Iranian midwife where to flee her country because she had practiced so-called virginity, sorry, virginity restoration surgery virginity restoration surgery. She was initially denied asylum in Canada. However, the translator who was clueless about medicine used the terms virginity curtain and virginity tissue instead of hymen. When an immigration officer asked the asylum seeker to describe the medical procedure, 
of course, being interested in whether this candidate actually, you know, knows the right terms. But the translator didn't know the right terms. That's the reason why people's fates can depend on these kinds of subtle differences, which can be highly relevant in practice. This leads me to my final point, which relates to a two-sided question. Is translation a process that is at its core linguistic? Or does it also imply other media? And the related question, does translation only occur between people or are non-humans also involved, perhaps even to an increasing degree? Anna addresses, as she has just done in her lecture, she addresses the second questions, the implication of non-humans, uh, in the final chapter of her book, which deals with the opportunities and limitations of automated meaning faster and cheaper above all translation, which is also referred to as statistical machine translations. Can't we just leave the whole thing to algos or robots? Translation isn't always and everywhere a high risk technology, as it is a fact that most people, as Anna writes, uh, say things they have already been said before and can be found these things in a vast data, data set stored on a computer server in a human brain or elsewhere in the coffers of civilization. So computer assisted interpreting is beneficial to a certain extent when working through the communicative redundancies that make up the vast majority of our speech and texts. And texts. It utterly fails, however, as soon as we no longer con conform to the criteria of smooth information flow. Translation, as Anna cites Derek Schilling, is not just typing a word, chain of words, or full paragraph in a backlit dialogue box and obtaining instant satisfaction with the touch of a button, voila. As long as people continue joking and swearing, praising and ironizing, uttering and writing things they mean or not, as long as speaking remains a fundamentally metaphorical activity, metaphor, of course, as you all know, but I still uh, insist on that point, from the Greek metaphorein, meaning to translate, to transport from one place to another, as long as this is so, translation will remain a total social fact, meaning that even machines have to be translated by others who can explain what they actually do and what they can't. Programs have to be written, of course. So writing on translation and translation technologies, um, Anna does in fact, trans that does in fact translation work, meaning that she opens what we call the black boxes of communication. So translation is also this in theoretical or, or learned or scholarly um, um, articulated contexts. It's, it's, it's a way of you know, translating what happens behind the scene in machines, but also in brains, of course, and in the practices of those who translate. That's what I mean with black boxes of communication. Machines, not only humans, have to use another Freudian term, they have tendencies. Very important term uh, for coin, tendencies. So we call them bias nowadays. By doing that, we expect them, by doing what we expect them to do, that is by merely operating, these machines always do something else. They do more than just operating. So this leads me to my very final question, the other question, whether translation only occurs between linguistic units. And I give several indications that this is by no means the case. Even before they utter a single words, diplomats, for example, who are incorrectly dressed and appear bodily, personally, in foreign courts, meeting the sovereign, while not moving in the ways considered appropriate 
can be understood as embodied insults. So it happened that they had to pay for their lack of sensitivity with draconian punishments. For media scholars, there is an even more fundamental aspect at play when it comes to the relationship between media and translation. This aspect can in turn be divided into two elements. Because all media are mixed media, translation presents a structural problem before a professional translator comes into the picture, so to speak. Let us take press photography and the image caption. How exactly, this is still a question, unsolved, I think. How exactly can this transition from the visual to the textual be described? There's always more to see in the picture than the caption claims. How do we deal with this surplus and with this gap? And the second, even more basic element, what is the relationship between technical recordings that do not use linguistic units, language, and translations? Let us once again consider photography whose so-called indexicality continues to present a theoretical challenge even today because it attempts to record that which no linguistic code could ever fully describe. Or voice recordings. How does a translator deal with the noisy sound that accompanies every spoken word? Is translation the art of stripping sound from what communication theory considers as information? How do we deal with the peculiar resistance of certain technical media which organize what Charles Baudelaire, the French poet, once called a riot of details, a riot of details, by, attempt, by attempting to record contingencies, coincidences, and provisionalities, in short, time itself. Do recording media transport something that is fundamentally alien to interpretation or translation? As film scholar Mary Ann Doan in her book on cinematic time speculated. So, so maybe my most fundamental, and that's my last sentence, so maybe my most fundamental question regarding Anna's book would be, what's the abyss like into which translators peer as they artistically balance or dance along the linguistic ropes? On the beautiful cover of her book, on the beautiful cover of her book, and only there, the title, Dancing on Ropes, is itself balanced by another phrase, pulling the string, yeah? you can read it here, pulling the string, written in green or yellow, I don't know. Um, so, so it's only reproduced, we talked about that before our meeting started, um, Anna and me, we talked about that. It's only reproduced on the cover, but not on the title page of the book. The title page of the book only says dancing ropes, but the cover says pulling the strings. So for me, the most, the most, Fundamental question would be, how are those two uh, expressions related, dancing on ropes and putting the string? So I, I could rephrase my question as follows. Why is it not enough to say that interpreters pull the strings? Why do they have to dance on the ropes risking their lives? Thank you.